Hi, kitty cats. I am Amethyst Herrick, your hostess for Gender Identity Weekly, a weekly discussion about identity and gender from the contributors and guests of the Purple Paw Publications website, genderidentitytoday.com. This content is brought to you by subscribers of genderidentitytoday.com. If you are already a subscriber, thank you so much for your ongoing support, because subscribers not only receive new content directly to their inboxes as soon as it publishes, but are also able to interact with every contributor directly. And that does include me, so... right? If you would like to support shows just like this one, as well as other podcasts and videos and written articles by me and by all of our contributors, please consider subscribing to genderidentitytoday.com gender using the links you will find in the show notes. Well, today I am very, very honored to be speaking with Sarah Webb. Hi, Sarah. Hi, how are you? Thank you for having me. Oh, I'm so happy that we get the chance to talk. I'm doing all right. How about you? Doing fantastic. It's happy much Pride. better. Yes, thank you. Happy Pride Month to you. This will be a this will be published during Pride Month too, and that's good. People listen to it and go, yeah. How come we don't do this for more months out of the year? Yeah. I don't know why, people. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm working on it. So, Sarah. So, Sarah is a resilience coach who specializes both in breakup and meditation coaching. And I found this I found this quote on your website. I love this: that you motivate your clients to feel they are living on purpose. Mm. Love that phrase, and on a path toward personal success. So, Sarah, I want to let me let me go back. Um, I know that there has been a lot of, I'm going to use the word trauma and I don't know if I, if this is the right one, but I know there have been a lot of adverse events that occurred during your life. Can you tell me whatever you're comfortable with? Can you tell me what events have really built this strength to be this person that I'm talking to today? Oh, thank you for that beautiful question. Trauma is a gift. That sounds really fucked up. But when, when we can zoom out later on, I mean, scientific studies show that when we have some time in between a traumatic event, we're able to experience what psychologists in the 1990s, uh, let's see, Richard Tedeschi and Lawrence Calhoun called post-traumatic growth. And mm -hmm. the key to living on purpose as you mentioned, is to be able to essentially zoom out in the moment and I see. see it for what it's actually going to do for us and to recognize challenges as, as opportunities. And in answer to your question, would you like that in Word or Excel format? Because I have a lot. <laughs> I'm... I'm really blessed. I mean, I've had a lot of blessings in my life and I have had a lot of opportunities to grow. I didn't come out until I was 38. So that in and of itself, I mean, the reason why I say so loudly queer hearts break harder is because we're either in the closet and we're broken hearted or we're out of the closet and we're broken hearted. And neither of those two things have anything to do with romance. Right. It's, it's just society and that own self-abandonment. I was raped when I was 28 years old by eight men. I'm, I didn't do I'm sorry. at all. D did you just say eight? I think it was eight. They drugged me and bent me over the back of a Jeep. And I had traces of it the next morning. They really beat me up. It was a oh my gosh. situation. I, I know oh so I was at one establishment at a bar and went to an, this guy who was the bartender. He said, my bar is closing. It was at this hotel where I was staying at. He said, come with me. I'm going to meet up with some friends. And it was like 10 dudes. And mm -hmm. uh, one, one shot, I was out. And I, I, you know, a woman knows. It was both holes. It was brutal. I was bruised and battered and I didn't deal with it at all. I shoved it down. My subconscious did a very good job and it just tucked that away and I drank and I drank to not deal with sure. it. 
So the first Mm -hmm. time I really started to look at it was when I was sober for the first time at the age of 34. So six years later, when I was pregnant with my Mm -hmm. now uh, seven, eight year old and seven or eight year old, she's almost eight. And it was, I had started a meditation practice and because I was, you know, not partying anymore because I was sober and growing a baby. And every time I got quiet, it wasn't, you know, reliving the trauma or anything. It was just like a, Hey, you remember this that you haven't dealt with? Cause yeah. we, we live in this 3d world, deny, distract, associate. And we have so many ways to live in the 3d world and deny, distract, associate. But it's, uh, it's a gift to be able to look with the eyes of a more evolved person who is living on purpose, who is living intentionally and unpack it with a lot of compassion. Yeah. This is, so I didn't write this down as a question, but I want to follow up on, on something. The three D's were deny, distract, distract and dissociate. There's a lot of value in that, isn't there? I mean, (laughs) don't misunderstand me. Uh You you don't live on purpose, but... It's easy. Because I'm really good at dissociating. Mm -hmm. And and I think there's been value to that in my life. The ability to dissociate and just be like, well, I'm just going to... I'm going to get through this task and I'm having going to have no idea how it happens, but I'm going to get the, get out the other end and go, well, Hey, task is done. Fabulous. There's value. The reason why I bring this up is because that's still considered a pathology, right? I mean, it's still in DSM, you know, there are many dissociative disorders that they bring up. I'm going to stop talking. I think you are right. And there's so many examples of when people don't even realize that they're dissociating. Yeah. No. So, you know, the example that you used sounds like maybe more being in flow. It can be regarded in a certain way, just kind of letting go of control and not trying to have an attachment to the outcome. True. Depends on you know how much that's bleeding over into your normal life and and how disruptive it might be to living idea. your life on a daily basis. <laughs> well, we don't have to go through all of this, but yes, <laughs> no, it definitely has been disruptive to my to my daily process, but. Because I actually had six weeks where I kind of lost, you know. Well, no, I kind of had six weeks I lost. but You lost some time. um, What's that? You lost some time, you're saying? Yeah, kind of the whole six weeks, yeah. That was, for what it's worth, it was actually what set me on the path of meditation, Mm. It was, it was, you know, I was like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to see my kid grow up if I don't fix myself. And so... So that's why we're talking now because I've done so much growth because of meditation, but it all came about because I really hit this bottom, you know, that, that it was like, if I don't claw my way out of this, it's not going to happen ever. So this wasn't supposed to be my story. (laughs) Well, I will say this happens a lot with clients and and don't worry about it. So the, (laughs) the (laughs) whole world is expanding and contracting. Everything on planet Earth is expanding and contracting. Everything. You can see it in nature with the seasons. You can see it with the tides. Of course, you can see it with our lungs, our literal heartbeats. Anything that's stagnant, flatlined, right? There's no life there. It's the definition of life is expanding and yeah. contractions. Mm-hmm. As far as the pendulum swings one way, it's going to swing the other way. So I would imagine that this cocoon of six weeks also gave birth to something really expansive. You really have studied a lot of Indian philosophy, haven't you? (laughs) We were talking about this beforehand, which, you know, always happens, but 
yeah, cyclicity is the word mm. that he used for that. But yeah, the seasons and mm-hmm. things grow in the dark. You know, we we fear mm. the dark for mm. some reason, but that's where all the good things come from because it has to. You know, that's it's the way mm-hmm. the the earth makes a seed turn into a sprout. Yeah. <laughs> so it's an excellent point. Um, I think we could go on and on and on about that, but I do want to talk about, I want to talk about your work because now what I, hopefully this question is still relevant. You're, you're now, you're, you're rebranding the, the support slightly, but at least originally your support network was all about supporting women and in particular lesbian women. So I think the question, I mean, the question I was going to ask is why focus your attention there in particular? Because I, I mean, I'm really pansexual, but I say I'm a lesbian because it's easy. And uh, so I'll give you the the full history of my company. I was, I don't want to say just, but I was just a meditation coach for anyone who was experiencing anxiety, in particular high functioning anxiety, which is a trauma response. (laughs) And so I was coaching people to learn meditation in order to get quiet because high functioning anxiety puts us into this constant state of fight or flight. We end up not being able to sleep, not being able to function and and, because we're all in sympathetic and we can't learn to get done. And so I, I was teaching people how to deal with that anxiety. Then my ex-wife asked for a divorce. And although I did go into a tailspin for a few weeks because it was my second divorce and because of my history of meditation, I was able to heal myself rather quickly. And I recognized because I was looking for somebody to process with that was gay and couldn't find anybody doing meditative work or, or healing trauma work that I felt comfortable with at least, and and certainly no one in the lesbian arena. So I said, this is an opportunity. I'm going to serve my community. So I started shifting my brand to, it's the same problem. It's the same results. We're still using meditation to find trauma because heartbreaks a trauma, but it's not the first one. It's rooted in childhood trauma. And what people who had high functioning anxiety didn't know is that they were coming to me for a current problem that was really rooted. And so we would have a four month program and then they would be like, gosh, while I'm meditating, these things are coming up from childhood. I'm like, tell me more. Let's go there. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and so they didn't know what they were getting themselves into. Now I'm dealing with the anxiety of heartbreak, you know, and it's, yeah. it, it is a really trying time. Did, did you see different, I'm not sure which word I want to use, like different results with women versus men? Well, I've, I'm blessed to have served, I believe, every gender at this point. <laughs> um, in fact, one of my clients is currently transitioning from non-binary to he, him. And so that is just you. an amazing journey to be on with him. He announced yesterday okay. his team and also um, trans women. And so I will say that it just depends on the person and how vulnerable they can be, not only with themselves, because they have to admit it first themselves, but also with me. And I find that it just depends on like, cause I, I do one-on-one coaching. I do group coaching and it just depends on the flavor. There are some people who come in on one-on-one coaching and they are out the door in six weeks, even though my program is <laughs> nine weeks long. And I'm like, okay, what do you want to do? You want to like call in your future wife? All right, let's like, let's work on it. You know, cause they're, they're healed. They're done. I, I had a client email me yesterday who was like, yes, I am flourishing. She's been out of the program for several months. And then, and then there are other people who really like that group because then they can learn from what other people say. Sure. And then there are other people who pay me and then quit. 
on themselves. So it really sure. depends on the person and that, that has nothing to do with gender or sexual preference at all. You have mentioned before this, that there is, this is science-based, that the results you're talking about are science-based. And I'm, I, I mean, I'm a meditator it's a myself. Fan of science and spirituality. So, you know, okay, we want to talk about the chakras. Great. The ancients identified it thousands of years ago. Did you know that there's an endocrine gland? There's, there's a gland, a hormonal gland that butts up next to every single chakra. So of yeah, course. it's, it's the, where they meet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, of course. I mean, I don't, I don't disagree. The, the point I was going to go to, cause I have, there've been a couple of, uh, of videos that I've made where I said, you know, quality of life is the best way of, of determining, well, quality of life. You know, the, did you, did, is your process effective because there are a lot of doctors who are just like look i know what's wrong with you here's the pill and you go Um, yeah i feel i still feel like shit and they go you shouldn't and you're like i but i hmm like how do you combat that right Mm. meditation is a great example of this because the you know there are Plenty of studies that show that meditation, when you start this, you feel so much better, but then science goes, but there's no reason. So we don't really recognize this as something that's a value. So, I mean, and you can see this across psychology too. If you do an qualitative study, people go, well, yeah, but you know, it's like qualitative, whoop de shit, you know, people feel better. So Right. It's self. Then I go, well, isn't that the. Is that what you're saying? It's self reporting. They, they have found that the amygdala in the brain actually increases with regular meditation. I'm sorry. The, the size of the amygdala decreases and the functioning of the prefrontal cortex increases. Okay. With regular meditation. They, they have done some studies. Okay. And this is just like functional MRI type studies or. Okay. Oh, interesting. All right. I got to tell you, I didn't know. Because I am a huge fan of meditation, by the way. I mean, and I, you know, I'm not, wasn't trying to say, you know, Sarah, all this is crap. Because oh. if I did, it wouldn't. There's no reason I would want to talk to you. Right? Oh, no. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, I can give you some statistics that might bolster your thinking around why meditation works. All around us, at every single moment, there are billions of bits of data doesn't Mm. matter if you're in your bathroom or on the top of a mountain. Billions of bits of data with a beam. The human brain and body can take in around 11 million bits per second. So billions of bits of data, 11 million bits per second that the brain and the body are taking in. But we're only conscious of about 45 bits per second. That's a significant difference there. 11 million versus 45? Per second. So on average, we're conscious of 0.04% of everything that is available to us. Oh my gosh. Okay. That's biologically available to us. Not, you know, not out of the billions, obviously. So, so the reticular activating system in the brain is what shows it's a filter and helps us to filter where we focus. Now, another statistic that might, so, so 0.04%, there's 99.96% of reality that we are processing via the subconscious. It, it, it's in there. We're aware of it. It's just, we need the reticular activating system to show us where to look. In the body, we have 11 million sensory receptors. Mm. Five senses, 11 million sensory receptors, 10 million are connected to our eyes. Oh gosh. Wow. So I say, and this is not anything you'll find anywhere except for out of my mouth (laughs) or on another podcast I've been on. I say, if you want to access that 99.96% of subconscious information that's already in there that you're just not aware of, you shut off 10 million of your 11 million sensory receptors and go inside. Yeah. Because that's when we can actually pay attention to how we're feeling. And when you look at the brain science of how we actually process life. Everything comes in as pure sensation. It is absolutely neutral. Sensation hits the brain. It goes first to the amygdala, safe or not. Is this safe or is it not? 
It's mm-hmm. not safe. Boy, we all the engines are firing. We this is not safe. We're going into fight or flight, you know, or the four Fs of stress, flight, fight, freeze, spawn. And if it's not, it pass, passes by the amygdala. And then we get to make a cognitive decision about what these sensations mean emotionally. I see. And the story that we're going to tell about it. So that's where we go in, is we, we reprogram the stories. I see. <clears throat> I've thought of meditation. I'm going to give you an analogy and see if this fits with uh, what, you, what you're talking about. Because I've thought of meditation. <clears throat> I don't know if you've ever fasted, um, like not eaten, kind of fasted for long periods of time, 10 days or so. Never that long. Mm-mm. But maybe three days. Even, yes. Well, I'd, I've done a couple of juice cleanses, and yes. I've not eaten for a couple of days for spiritual reasons. Yeah. yeah, and and I think there's a reason why it works for spiritual purposes. But you know, your the body goes into different processes, and so it's able to clean up. It goes it goes from anabolic processes down to catabolic processes. And so it starts chewing up all the junk that we get inside each individual cell that we don't typically clean up. Right. Hopefully this, this parallel is starting to (laughs) starting to come clear because I think of meditation, you sit down for 20 minutes or however long you meditate. That's generally what I do. And I think of it as a fast that your brain goes, I've got all of this junk that I just got to start chewing up. Mm. So you, you reach a catabolic process where the brain's like, okay, I can get rid of this and get rid of this, get rid of this. Does that, how does that fit into, does that, does that work at all for you? How about if I just ask that? (laughs) I really like that analogy a lot because one of the biggest I don't get this so much anymore because I do a lot of guided meditation. It's very focused on breath work and, and releasing trauma mm-hmm. related to heartbreak. But the, one of the bigger comments that I got from people who weren't yet clients when I was just a meditation coach was I can't turn my brain off. And I'm like, you don't have to, <laughs> you, you, don't, you don't need to stop the thoughts. And they're like, but I'm thinking about the grocery list. And I'm like, okay, cool. Well, we want to focus yeah. on something else because I can give you something else to focus on because we can tell the RAS where to look. And then you'll probably forget the mantra or you'll forget to count. And then you're like, oh, it it teaches us if you're doing that kind of self-guided, you know, where you're focusing on something, it teaches us self-compassion slowly so that we don't Mm. say, gosh, I'm not, I'm not doing the, you know, oh, okay. I'm not, I'm not doing it. I'm going to go back to it. But I think the fasting is really beautiful. I think for me, cause I do 20 minutes twice a day as well. For me, I really feel like I let go of a lot when I go for longer. And on every other Saturday, when I don't have my daughter, I try to like just meditate for as long as I can. And those are the times when I'm just like, Oh, that was delicious. You know? Yeah. Delicious air. <laughs> you, you had mentioned breath work and I, I had, absolutely no intention to ask about it but now i do because i'm actually really fascinated i'm fascinated by pranayama Mm -hmm. i've always because for hmm, how do i back into this especially considering i didn't think about it breath is a huge thing to me there are a lot of there are a lot of places to unpack around this that particular statement. But how about if I just say, breath is really big. Why is breath work like a big component of of what you do, or particularly in in uh, conjunction with meditation? Most people aren't even aware of their breath, and it, along with the tongue, are the only two aspects of the autonomic nervous system that we can willfully control. We don't have to think about how to form words, and we don't have to think about breathing. But we can think about how to form words and we can sure. think about breathing. So those are the two things. And breath, like the ancients said, prana means life force energy. Yeah. It's synonymous. And if you think about like when you are born, you take a breath and that is the beginning of life. And when you die, you breathe your last breath because we can survive, you know, talk about fasting. I always say we can survive for weeks without food, a few days without water, yeah, but only easily. a few minutes without our breath. It, that is really key. And 
when we go into a state of fight or flight, we immediately stop breathing properly because our ancient physiology is here to save us so that we're conserving energy initially so that we can fight or flee. Of course, today it's an email and traffic and our boss and our kids and deadlines that make us stop breathing properly. And then we're already in the limbic brain. We're already not having access to our prefrontal cortex. And then on top of that, our hearts and bodies are not being properly oxygenated. So what I teach my clients is just very simple, very accessible, only with certain clients who do not have any health issues. Because breath work, especially um, breath retention, yeah. can be dangerous if you, if you have any like high blood pressure or anything like that. So everything I teach for groups is safe for everyone. And so I'm really just breath awareness is really like if I could teach anything, just like be aware of your breath because <laughs> they're calling it right. email apnea or tech apnea where people realize really? they're holding their breath while yeah. they're like waiting for the email to come through, waiting for the, you know, it's like this bracing where they don't even realize that, that they're holding their breath. And interesting. what's interesting is like, so people do a cold bath on purpose and it has all these great results. People get hypothermia if it's not on purpose. So same thing with breath. You know, if, if you're intentionally holding your breath and intentionally trying to relax your muscles and knowing I'm doing this for a greater good, you know, the science behind it, it becomes incredible. But if you're holding your breath without like against your own will, essentially, <laughs> then it can be detrimental to your health. There's so many things I want to ask. They're all combating in my head going, ask about... There was a Russian scientist who studied a lot of breath stuff. Buteko, I believe was his name. Yes. Buteko. Do you, yo, okay, that's the right. I got it right. Did you read Breath by James Nestor? No. He references there was. Yeah, you would love okay. that book. James Nestor, Breath. Amazing book. I've read it twice. Okay. I'll read books twice. All right. <laughs> I will take a note for that. Yeah. Because the, the technique that he's got, mm -hmm. it, I mean, really, he says, you know, we just breathe too much. We just need to breathe less. And I know I've, you know, I started looking at that technique and I'm like, like, how do, you, how do you come to this conclusion? How do you go, you know what your problem is? You breathe too much. Let's try breathing less. And I don't know how we would have come to it, but I, I think that that's a lot of what pranayama does for you, that you end up figuring out that you need less. You know, energetically, you need less. And the, I think if you're, if you're running less energy through you, oh boy, I'm going to show my background as an electrochemist here, but the less electricity you've got to flow, you've got to flow through you, the less resistance yes. you tend to experience. Yes. So anyway, I'm glad that you, that you knew exactly who I was talking about, that Buteyko guy. I'll see if I can remember. I think it's B-U-T-E-Y-K-O, if yeah. I remember correctly. Is it? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but have you, so have you experienced with, a, uh, experimented with those, those techniques at all? I have tried some. Mm -hmm. The breathwork techniques that I employ most often are Kundalini breathwork okay. techniques. I use a lot of breath of fire and like to go to sleep at night, instead of taking melatonin, you can inhale, like fill up the belly, intentionally relax all the muscles and then slow exhale. <clears throat> Any of the techniques that allow you to slow the exhale is going to naturally activate the parasympathetic mm -hmm. nervous system. I have plenty of sympathetic, although the breath of fire is sympathetic nervous system activation, but I'm doing sure. it intentionally and then holding holding full, holding empty. And it's just like the ice bath. It's like you're, you're stressing the system so that your system pushes cytokines into the blood, which are basically natural painkillers. Mm. And so I, I don't know a whole lot about Butego except for that book. Although he does talk about the, I happen to have this book here, uh, Autobiography of a Yogi and, sure. and other um, I must have been using it with a client here, but the reason why Butego, I think he was looking at the animal kingdom and mm -hmm. noting 
elephants, tortoises, all these beings that live longer, breathe slower and breathe less. Right. You're right. And that was modern, part of it. Yeah. I mean, modern, we, we need to breathe five times per minute. And most humans breathe about 16 times per minute. It's I think it's so higher. Yeah, really? even as much as like 20. Yeah. yeah. That it's a breath about every four seconds. Well, I guess that's 15. Mm -hmm. My math was, I was a chemist. So, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I actually happen to be very familiar with Yogananda's um, techniques and everything. I mean, do you do a lot of self realization? Um, what is it? Self realization. Fellowship foundation. What is that? The fellowship. Yeah, I, I'm a member. That's a ref. Yeah, I'm a member, and I I also okay. recently subscribed to Ananda, which was the counterpart that he kind of had a rift with at the end of his life. Mm. I, I've done some of it. Um, I just I dabble, and I am such a creative person that, and his technique is it does have some variability and it's some choice but I don't want to do the same meditation every single day. It's like, I was talking to you in the green room that I, I heard a few months ago, like that I needed to do this one Kundalini Kriya for 40 days. And I was like, mm. but I don't want to do that for 40 days. <laughs> and I did it. I did it. Well, Kundalini does a lot of 40 day or 90 day or a hundred day okay. or a thousand day. Like you do the same thing for that many days. And, and I heard it so clearly that's what I needed to do. And I was like, oh, Doing. and it involves a lot of a lot of breath work and it is just amazing the liberation that you can find by even just like taking something from here and, and, and i don't trust any master who says my way is the only way do not do and when he got to that in his teachings i was like i'm sorry dude no no i'm just you can't tell me that it's the only way that that egocentrism, and you are leaning into your, your humanity because it is oneness. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree. I laughed mostly because I'm thinking about like Yogananda shows up and you just go, "Sorry, dude." Just calling <laughs> Yogananda, dude. <laughs> like an enlightened master, <laughs> right? Just what's up, dude. I am him. I mean, this is this is part of the work. Yeah. But I do, but I do agree. There's, there's, um, there is a saying in, in Ayurveda and I don't know how much Ayurveda you study. I but, a little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I actually started, believe it or not, I actually started going down like a path. I thought, oh, I'm going to get a bunch of training in Ayurveda. I'm going to open a clinic. Uh, clearly it didn't happen because here mm -hmm. I am sitting with you, sitting in front of you with purple hair and stuff and <laughs> not doing anything with Ayurveda. But one of the biggest, um, points of Ayurveda is that, you know, each of us has a balance. And so the, the, I won't use mantra, but you know, the idea is that everything works for somebody, but nothing works for everybody, mm -hmm. which, which I did, you know, so much of Western medicine is like, well, you're kind of low on vitamin D and you go, well, low how? And they go, well, normal people have a vitamin D level, right? Okay, well, I, maybe I'm just an abnormal person. And they go, no, that cannot happen because we are in the West and we only have normal people here. Yeah. They go, but, but so we don't even admit that there are people, that, that nothing works for everybody. Mm -hmm. And candidly, I think that's a big part of why we have to pathologize everything because mm. mm. because without without turning things into pathologies we have no real need for medicine right if it's balance you have to talk to the person well what's wrong with you oh does that hurt okay well let's let's fix this um i'm going off on a big ass tangent that i should really reel back in well i agree with you that it's about getting to the source Whereas mm. so much of Western medicine is treating the symptoms. Yes, very much. And so much. when we have shitty things that continue to happen in our life, we have to look at the source and be like, oh, I'm repeating the same subconscious patterns because most of my life is being run by my subconscious. Thank goodness right. I don't have to think about 
how to unlock my door every single time. Thank goodness I've got this amazing subconscious. And time to look at it. And the way that we look at it is by going into the same, we, we were in a meditative state from zero to seven and a semi-meditative state from seven to 14, but especially zero to really? seven. Ages zero to two, we're in delta, which is deep sleep. It's the lowest brainwave frequencies. And from two to seven, we're in theta, which is hypnosis. Mm-hmm. So yeah. that's why kids play so well in this total suspension of reality and they don't have the development of the prefrontal cortex yet, which starts around eight to 10 years old and doesn't finish till you're 25, 27 study show. Right. This helps us logicize and figure things out and regulate ourselves. Instead, everything is coming in as absolute fact. We don't ever sit there and say like, oh, my mom doesn't want to play with me today. It must be that she is really stressed and overworked. No, we internalize it. And we're like, something's wrong with me. I'm bad. I'm not enough. And then we end up with these really disempowering phrases that we have our reticular activating system look for and confirm for us our entire lives based off of the meditative state that we were in from zero to seven. And then from zero to seven, we get... All of, I mean, just, it's a huge ripple. And so when we're adults and we're having these shitty things, I call this the itty bitty shitty committee, but it's really the itty bitty kitty committee because it's just rooted in childhood and it's replaying the same things so that we can choose different. This is a great segue, in my opinion, (laughs) for, for talking about, you have core values, core values of the process that you teach. And so presumably you, you work to foster like a building all of these core values, right? In, in our, in your, your uh, clients' lives. Well, actually one of the first things that I have my clients do is find out their core values. I share mine, but what really is going to move the needle because when we go into a triggered state, fight or flight, we usually aren't acting according to our core values. Sure. So it's important to know what yours are. And then once they're kind of feeling good, then we're like, oh, okay, well, this is nice and fuzzy. Let's find out what your core wounds are. And at the same time, what are your core needs? What do you really need? Because a lot of times when we have mental illness, pathology, I think that a lot of this can be solved with just looking at how am I bypassing my needs and succumbing to the worst of my core wounds. If we can look at those, of course, we look at a lot of other things like thoughts and behaviors and all kinds of coping mechanisms that are unhealthy, but the two really crucial things are to find out well, at first, who am I? Your roots. You know, what, what goal do I want to set? <laughs> Sorry about that. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> who am I? What goal do I want to set? And then how am I going to get my needs met without expecting somebody else to meet them? And then if, if I can ask them to help me, then great. But, and also make sure that I am paying attention to the judgments I'm making about how people are perceiving me or, you know, what aversions if, if a client is somebody who's super avoidant, you know, we're we're basically getting into the attachment states that were given to us as children, which I call it an attachment state because it's not an attachment trait. It's a state and it can be changed. Ooh, that's a great, that's a great statement. (laughs) We got to write that down. I just came up with it a couple of days ago. So. <laughs> really? Oh God, it's great. The um, you, but the question, "Who am I?" is kind of a big one. I mean, it's a whole branch of yoga around that. But mm. well, it goes much deeper than that. Like you are no one, right? You are nothing. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I've, I've sure. done meditative styles that are like every time you get triggered, just ask my ask yourself, "What am I feeling?" Okay, I'm feeling angry. Who is feeling angry? And you're supposed to just sure. like realize that you are not a person. And I'm like, that's tough for some people, but I get it. It does it does help to recognize 
this isn't like who, cause we are the observer, right? We, we animals have this ability to schizophrenically talk to ourselves in our head mm -hmm. and, and fantasize about the future and reminisce about the past and not ever be present. And so that whole, who am I question? Yeah, it's loaded. This is more like what's important to me <laughs> and, and um, you know, how do I want to like really exist on a day-to-day -day basis? I see. I mean, is, is one of the first things you have to break down that idea that we are our body? I, I, I don't. I don't even mess with that. Really? I, How I, many transgender clients did you say you've had? Because Well, I, I teach a lot of embodiment. I see. Body awareness. Because a yeah. lot of humans, doesn't matter what your gender, are not aware of what's going on. And they're not aware that when something happens out here... It's activating a literal subconscious vibration. This is that intersection of spot science and spirituality where we actually have the trauma. Like in yoga, we say the issues are in the tissues. And so when something adverse happens, we go into the body. One of my first teachers, Dr. Sue Mortar, you might be familiar with her work, the energy mm -hmm. coach. One of my first coaches, she taught me how to coach. Uh, you know, she says, take it to the body immediately. Whenever you're feeling that trigger, like take it to the body. And, and then I go a few steps further and we start asking questions. Like we, we just reduce it to the vibration only. And then we start asking questions like, when have I felt this way before? Oh, when is the first time I felt this way? And it's an iterative process. It doesn't happen all at once. It's not like all of a sudden, like do it once. You know, that's why I, coach for several weeks teaching. And then once we find the core original wounds, then we're like, okay, what am I making it mean about me, about my future? Sure. And then we can do the reprogramming once we find those things. I like that actually quite a bit that, that you don't focus on the body. Actually though, curious body awareness. I have a thought around that, but what do you mean by body awareness when you say that? Well, part of it is breath awareness, but just noticing the body. There are so many humans who will be sitting at a desk and their legs fall asleep and then they stand up and fall over because they're not even aware that their legs are asleep. And that's a simple example of just a lot of people are just so because of trauma, because of whatever they're, they're so focused on screens and outside input and they're not like unless somebody is like unless comfort is like really important to somebody that might be a really you know a, a really important need but otherwise a lot of people are just not body aware and so it's you know I coach my clients to once they are healed from heartbreak and they're going back out into the dating scene check in with your body when you're on that date check in after you get home with your energy level what did that do for me? Did it take, did it actually amplify? Just teach. And also like, am I breathing? Am I breathing properly? Is this person putting it? Right. Cause like all those butterflies in the belly, danger, danger. Really? That's sympathetic nervous system arousal. Oh, okay. And it's a what? sure signal. Well, it's a potential danger. It's an opportunity to choose whether or not like this might because vibrationally we're going to choose partners who are just like the parent that caused the attachment wound. Sure. oh sure <laughs> we don't realize it so whenever we're in this like super high state it danger <laughs> just pay attention and just make sure that you're not abandoning yourself you're communicating your needs you, you know you're digging into like what am i making this mean that they want to go on another date with me or whatever it is it's just really like um an ex-girlfriend of mine called it like um staying in while going out yeah i have never heard that there are people who wouldn't notice their legs fell asleep I mean, I've led past clients in, I, I've done a lot of sexual trauma healing and in person, in person events with like yoga and journaling and chakra awareness and stuff like that. And I've had clients 
say like, I can't feel the bottom of my torso at all. Like, cause you know, we were in a lay down meditation and I was leading them and they came up to me afterwards and they're like, I, I, I can't feel it. And I'm like, okay, are you comfortable telling me about any, any major sexual trauma in that area? And they're like, yeah. oh yeah, lots for years. You know, so we dissociate in certain areas for, and, and for good reason. It's our body protecting us. It's beautiful. It's amazing. It's like, thank you so much. We wouldn't survive. Right. That's the benefit that I was talking about. <laughs> right. Um, wow. So, geez, there's so many paths to, to, to continue walking down here. I so what, mm, I know. Sometimes my brain, I'm like, okay, just pick one. <laughs> you know what though, for what it's worth, it's been great because like my brain does the same. Right. And so it's just like, Oh, look, you went down a squirrel path too. I'll go too. What do you <laughs> Where'd we end up? Where the hell are we? I mean, it's like a tree. I never saw this tree before. I don't think we're in Kansas anymore, which is good because neither of us we don't is in Kansas. Kansas. No more Kansas. No. <laughs> you know, there, so there were two two things that I, that I hope to, to talk about. Because you brought up journaling. Mm. I'd see journaling as, as a good sister practice to meditation. Mm -hmm. What do you, why, why would you use journaling? Why, why would you bring that up? Well, I see prayer as talking to God, meditation as listening and journaling as this outlet to get into the, you know, that automatic writing. There's a lot of, um, there, there are some studies that point to the fact that you know, just for example, when we take notes, we are like, holding the pen or pencil and seeing ourselves and thinking about what we're writing. So it's, it's enacting all these different ways of learning. And then when you get into automatic writing, sometimes these things come out that you really didn't even know were in there. I use oral journals a lot and I, I, I have lots of journals. Go ahead. Do you mean rec recording that? Is that what you mean? So, yeah. okay. Yes. Like a voice note on my phone. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you thank you for the clarification. And I used to journal a lot more and it's more of a, just an amalgamation of notes these days. Like when I meditate, I get access to, to the quantum field and it's like, it's just pouring out. And so it ends up like on stray notes or like expo markers on mirrors or, you know, like it's just, I can't, it's such a, a heavy flow. And I, I was looking through a journal today for something and I was like, wow, I, I need to revisit that. You know, like so much comes out, but uh, I'd love to hear your take on journaling too. Oh shoot. I didn't know it was going to be put on the spot. Um, oh, kidding. <clears throat> I, <laughs> and you can, no, no, no. Um, I think journaling is for the same reasons you just brought up when you, because you have picked up a pen in particular and, and then qualified something else as oral journaling because I, there are people who will type out journals. And to me, it's not the same because no. holding a pen, you were using your right hand, but sorry, you know, left-handed here. So, oh, yay. Um, you're right. I and I use that. a, it, it does mean, yeah, I mean, means I end up with a bunch of like ink on my finger, right. but right. my hand there, but because I love fountain pens too. I always, always wanted to use a fountain pen, but I was, but I was like, well, I can't because I'm left-handed. I'm just going to smear it. But then I met a, I had a, a met a guy that <laughs> came out sounding weird, uh -huh. but I have a friend who was like, gosh, you know what I do is write with fountain pens. And I went, wait a minute, aren't you left-handed? And he's like, yeah, it's no problem. So I bought one and it's, I've never looked back. That was Oh, 15 years ago. Yeah. Like 15 years ago. So great. So tactile and so sensuous, mm -hmm. sensuous, not sensual. Yeah. Like that's the, it's, it's really anyway, it doesn't have to be with a, with a fountain pen folks, but when, when your hand is doing something, I think you cannot think that quickly. Mm. I'm trying to think of how I want to put this. You have to, you have to cue everything up so that it comes out of your pen. If you don't, 
this is why typing is something because I could probably type about a hundred words a minute. I've been doing this was a software developer, you know, you kind of gotta. Well, I thought so. But with writing, you cannot. With actual, you know, handwriting, you cannot. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one of the bigger benefits of journaling mm -hmm. is not really getting down your thoughts, but making them line up <laughs> so that you get the, you have to get them going down, you know, a, a straight line to get them onto, you know, into your journal. When you wrote off the wall question, but when you wrote, were you doing it in cursive? My writing is kind of a mix of cursive and print, but more print. Yeah. I haven't written in cursive in a long time. Right. It's important. We don't, but. It is. Do you, here, I'm, now I'm going to have to tell you the story. I'm sorry. When I was going, when I was, was in transition, so I, it was 2023. I've been writing in a journal for, I don't know, a long time, since 2005. And it was 2023, and I'm writing in my journal in the mountains. And I went, No this is not me writing because I looked at my writing and it was the same writing I had when I was in graduate school, writing in a lab book, things that were legal document type things. Now what, this isn't me. So I said, I'm going to write in cursive. And I had not written in cursive possibly since high school, might've been junior high. I don't even know. So I was like, well, let me see how I could, how I do it. It is so hard <laughs> initially because now it flows for me. But, um, it was another way of forcing myself to slow things down and put them into a line mm -hmm. that's valuable. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I sort of see all of those meditation and, and, and writing, you know, handwriting is, is similar that, that we have to slow down and actually taste the thoughts that we're mm -hmm. feeling. Mm -hmm. That didn't taste the that. thoughts that we're feeling. I don't, yeah, that was not as good as, you know, I think it's beautiful. State versus trade. That one was much more, that was I much snappier. <laughs> I love it. Taste those thoughts. I love it. <laughs> We're very similar. I do things to challenge my brain and body often, like trying to do something with my left hand instead of my mm -hmm. right. And just habitually, like instead of picking up the sponge with the right hand, switch it over. And, and it's hard at first. It's mm -hmm. amazing how in it's a make it's it's a wonder that my right arm isn't giant and the left one isn't withered because right. it's like a hoof. I'm like I can't. I have no wrist action. I'm like what? What is this thing? I can't, I can't. So I, I, you're probably more ambidextrous, just living in a right hand world. Yeah, you're kind of forced into it, but. Mm -hmm. When you had brought up body awareness, though, that was the first thing that came to mind because I used to run barefoot. I love walking barefoot. Oh, my gosh. I, in Florida, I don't know that you're going to be able to pull that off because mm -hmm. it's like, you know, 120 degrees and <laughs> cook. There's kids out there cooking eggs on the ground. You're yeah. like, cut it out. <laughs> but I love walking barefoot because you, you had mentioned 10, I think you said 11 million sensors. Mm -hmm. that we have of the remaining one there's only one at one part of your body that has more nerve endings than your genitalia and that's your feet and your hands your well. hands are actually your hands are a little less yes. than wow. your feet interesting tidbit so point being that i use so i was i was into barefoot running i don't run so much anymore that's aggressive and impressive Not, no you just have to change your form you have to change your form a lot. And I thought it won't be a big deal. I can keep writing or running when I'm, when I'm, and maybe I'd be better, but I started developing upstairs. And so then I was like, God, I got to get a good sports bra. And that's hard, right? Everybody out there listening is like, yeah, sports bras suck. They do. <laughs> Point being that I run, ran barefoot and you have to develop proprioception ridiculous proprioception to the point where you're like for 10 feet ahead and you don't notice this, but for 10 feet ahead, you're going to know where every rock is mm -hmm. subconsciously. And mm -hmm. so you put down a foot and you don't step on rocks. Anyway, 
it's a similar thing with your hands because, because you know, there are many people I'm looking at a camera, so it's not going to work, but there are many people who have trouble doing this. You know, they know they, they don't know where their hand is to, to do something like this. Hmm. Sorry by the, this folks, if you're listening to this, like if you put your hand out where you cannot see it, can you touch it? See, you've got that. Because yeah. now try doing it with your feet. You know, can you can you touch your two feet together and it's and it's easy? Yeah. Can you can you touch your foot to your hand? I mean, yeah. anyway, when you said body awareness, that was the first thing I thought of is more. Are you aware of how your body operates? And it's a similar, you know, which foot do you put your shoe on first? It's always my left. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I go, okay, I'll put my sock on the right hand. <laughs> Foot, and then I'll put my shoe on the left foot and go, oh, shit, I forgot to put the sock there. Take the shoe off. Put the... Yeah. It's not true. I mean, a couple of times. <laughs> More times than I want to admit. Let's move on. Um, so, yeah, I don't know where I was going with this. Squirrel trail was awesome, though. What do you... <laughs> I'm sorry, Sarah. Body awareness. And yeah, body, who knows? Oh, challenging yourself. It was all challenging yourself. Right, right. And so that's important. Writing in cursive. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Well, sure. Writing in cursive is one of them. But yeah, challenging yourself is important. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I see this in your in your core values, the idea of growth and self-discipline. Mm -hmm. Both of those force that, right? You have to stick yourself in places where you go, ah, this isn't, can I do this? You know so, what's really fascinating? I think you'll like this. What? This is this is definitely inside information that your people are getting. Cool. When you look at, because usually like you've got to be enrolled in one of my programs to, to know this, but I'll just talk about it from a personal sense. I am that deadly combination of both anxious and avoidant attachment state. And so I've got a little bit of both. And people who are both anxious and avoidant, some of their top core values tend to be growth because they grew up in chaos where they didn't have any control. So our values are often linked to our core wounding mm -hmm. because we were in a situation, and I, this is true for me, absolutely, I did not have any control until I was 18 and I went, fucking nuts. <laughs> but now I, I can control what I do. And so I, if I go a day without listening to a book, listening to a podcast, I don't feel well. And if it's a mm -hmm. couple days, I am really not do like, as far as like from a mental health perspective, it's something that yeah. is so crucial for my ability to, to exist normally. So you might find that too, that like some of this desire, and of course it is so beautiful that I'm using one of my core values and something that's so important to me. I'm never going to stop. I'm never going to stop growing. I'm always right. getting, getting more certifications. I have so many certifications. It's ridiculous, but it's the reason why I'm weaving things together in this really unique way. And nobody's doing what I'm doing because I've just, I just love learning Sure. That's different, though, for what it's worth. And I think our concept, I'm going to bring back cyclicity, right? Because we think to ourselves, it's always going to be summer in the stock market. Mm -hmm. Everything's always growing, 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 growing. And then we go, what the hell? Oh, my God, my stock lost a buck. Yeah, yeah that's that's cyclicity. That's, you know, even financial markets experience this, but we don't like that mm -mm. that was a really you know i brought that in from nowhere but it is it's a the idea that that we always grow like i think that's okay as people because we're always getting better but i think your growth is i'm talking about you in particular your growth is probably cyclic as well so yeah absolutely and i think you know, leaning into those cycles is really, we, we you know, 
coming really full circle back to meditation, we see the outside world as being static. And that's why people say change is hard and yeah, and it, and it can be, but it's so not static. It's, it's in constant flux. It's expanding and contracting and meditation yeah. helps us to realize that change and to be more flexible when things do change because we are shutting off 10 million of our 11 million sensory receptors and paying attention right. to the fact that like, gosh, even our cell phones need to be reset. Like everything needs that downtime. Otherwise yes. it's, it's going to expire. It's the dark. It's the dark where the things grow. Yes. Love that Sarah. Um, we're running low on time. I have the feeling that like you and I would be able to sit down on like a Friday and then suddenly go, Oh, it's Monday. Exactly. I'm sorry. <laughs> Did you have something you wanted to do during the weekend? No, yeah, this totally worked. Agree. I feel such a connection with you. Thank you oh, so thank much you. for this conversation. It has been oh. the highlight of my week. Oh, gosh. Thank you. That, oh, I'm going to cry. Um, can you tell people where we can find more about Sarah Webb? Absolutely. Yeah, you can find me everywhere at Sarah Webb says, S A R A W E B B. S-A-Y-S. So there's no H on Sarah. Two B's in web. And it's like Sarah Webb says, S-A-Y-S. So sarahwebbsays.com. I'm on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. You can buy me a coffee at Sarah Webb Says. <laughs> nice. It's all kinds of stuff. I'm glad. There's, there is... I love I love all the information that's on your website. It is very. Oof, I want a word, and I'm not coming up with it. H humanistic. I was going to say, it's mm. it's focused on the re the real experience of being human. Is that what, what humanistic means? Because I think oftentimes we go, well, we, we can just get better, right? So I'll take a pill or I'll, I'll just I'll start a, a, a course. You talk about pushing yourself, that you have to, I mean, you called originally trauma a gift. And mm -hmm. I think that's great. You know, it's, it's important to think of life as, in my opinion anyway, as, as a set of challenges that we can overcome. And that's what I see in you and on your website. And wow. Well, now I need to look at my website because I don't want to scare people off because <laughs> I tried to make it pretty, like not esoteric and not like this is going to require you to do some work. You know, I want them to come in and then figure out that they have to do some work after. <laughs> <laughs> well, I read between a lot of lines. How about if it, no need to, no need to look at your copy. It was just... <laughs> I read between a lot of lines, maybe, but, um, all right, gosh, I guess I'll shut this down. Sarah, I'm just going to tell you, I mean, thank you so much for, you know, for this conversation. Um, I'll say thank you to our listeners. I'm Amethyst Herrick. You've been listening to Gender Identity Weekly with Sarah Webb, where we learned that trauma is a gift. So thank you again, Sarah. Thank you.